for SIP and uh, related clients to get a foothold onto that market because ultimately I think it's the mainstream user which makes a product like Skype live or die. Um, and once you get the mainstream user who maybe just, like we said, oh, like I've said before, uses a computer like a toaster as a tool to do a task, if uh, if SIP clients were to, to get onto the foothold into those uh, into that that base now, I think there's a good chance that maybe Skype will never will never see the light of day more so than it more than it has at the moment with its I think six million users I think it had worldwide because like I say from my experience people aren't saying oh yeah Skype are you on Skype they're asking if you're on Twitter but that's only just recently when there's, when there's a bar I think that started with the Oprah yeah, Winfrey too, too Winfrey too yeah, I mean, this is just my experience. It, it's something that I've noticed. But Skype, I, th- I assumed when I first started using Skype that everybody would be using it. It seemed a great service. It was very convenient. But it surprised me that the mainstream average user really, nine times out of ten, didn't have a lot of knowledge about it. Maybe just in passing had heard the word. Where it was popular, I did notice. Um, I worked with a couple of people who uh, have relatives in other countries. And maybe they're over here uh, working for a couple of years. And it seemed to be very popular with them because obviously it was cheaper for them to make long distance calls and a very good way for them to connect. So, but for the British born member of public, it didn't seem to be, it hasn't seemed to be uh, in the mainstream yet. And yeah, that's my observation. It, it very much, if you look at the uh, distribution of, uh, uh, how should you call it, social network services, and you look at the geography of these things that, uh, if you look at Brazil compared to the UK compared to the US, and you look at the usage of Twitter, uh, it's a very much a viral type of uh, effect where uh, in a certain country you can have loads of people opening a Twitter account, uh, whereas in another country, for not parent trees and nothing to do even with languages, almost nobody would use that because none of the friends happen to be on it. Mm. Uh, and, and, and you can easily show these on maps and you know where people use. I think Facebook has got something like above a certain age, and maybe 15 or so, it's like 96% of people have an account. I, I thought it was a bit dubious. It means people put their grandma on it. You know, and, 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 yeah, I think it's a 96%. I, I, maybe they kind of changed the tweak the definition of what it means to be on uh, Facebook. But uh, the, the thing is with Twitter, and uh, you mentioned Twitter, in some countries not many people would use that. In some countries, I suppose people also uh, for instant messaging would use something else than no, other than uh, MSN, or in some countries you might not even use uh, instant messaging, you might use Facebook to communicate with people. Uh, the thing is with Skype, though, I, I think, did you say 6 million users? I think they have a lot more. But the number of paid users, uh, uh, based on the uh, calculation from this person called uh, uh, Satipera, or Sat- Satipera, one of the listeners, he, uh, uh, Microsoft basically paid on average, $800 for each paying customer of Skype. So that would mean that maybe we're talking about 10 million uh, paid users yeah. of Skype. Well, I'm, like. I'm just pulling up the f- um, figures now. So the six six million maybe was a rather silly uh, silly number to give. And I I'm, think the number of paying users more. based yeah. on this number it would be something like 10 million people who actually pay for it. Some people are just so-called oh. you know, free riders. And since Skype doesn't have any ads, just has a lot of spam, Especially recently, all this spam people sending me all kinds of like walking on my webcam that stuff. Uh, but, you know, it's, it doesn't. It means they 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 try to see the market, put themselves in a position where they enjoy the network effect and will get some paying customers. But the number they have globally, you know, being the most prominent service for internet phone, uh, if it's something like 10 million people, that's very few. Uh, among the connect, people connected to the internet, you're talking about something like less than one percent of the population of the internet that should be paying for Skype. I think I just haven't called up the uh, Skype client. According to the the stats on the uh, on the bottom of the client, it's twenty four million two hundred fifty one thousand eight hundred sixty three people are connected currently online as we record this to Skype. So uh, yes, six million was rather a bit of a low figure. Um, but like I say, it's it hasn't struck me as being in the mainstream yet from my experiences. And like I say, I think that comes down to people's need. I mean, in the UK, we're quite lucky because local rate calls and keeping in touch with relatives within the same country is actually relatively cheap. Yeah. And I think when people are coming from abroad, maybe working here, they're always looking for ways to make calls home for cheaper. And Skype would have been one of the avenues that they would have investigated. And that's maybe why it's more, better well known with them. Um, 
But anyway, st- sticking with yeah, Google. The thing is, uh, the calls have been made cheaper partly because of the competition. It's actually it's important because it shows you how the prices are being changed because of what's available. And it shows you the, well, value of competition, I suppose. Uh, uh, but then the telecoms have to evolve to provide better internet services and all kinds of, uh, they have all these advanced services and packages to offer to businesses to actually offer something that's above the, you know, above the minimalist uh, requirements. And this is how they're supposed to make money, by going beyond what they did 20 years ago. Well, if we stick with Google, um, I've got a couple bit of news about uh, one thing that uh, is happening in the Android marketplace. And unfortunately, it's been reported that uh, Android is removing its uh, emulators. Yeah. They're hitting that famous kill switch and taking away users' yeah. ability uh, to... Be, be careful before you... Uh, I, I put it as Google's thing. The way to put it is Google is being pressured to take down... Oh, yes. Yeah. So I was, yeah, was okay. going to move on to that. But okay. the first point I was going to make was this. Um, this has actually already been happening. Whilst this hit the news about four or five days ago, it, it actually happened quite a while back when the PS1 emulator was taken off the Android marketplace. And I believe that was around about the end of May. Um that, from what I can see, remained largely unreported, and there's a few sites that touched on it, and that maybe was a hint, at, well, a prelude to what's coming now. And whilst Roy mentions some that I was going to bring up, the, the pressure from other, other, uh, from the copyright holders, dare I say, yeah. um, w- would be a reason. And yeah. it doesn't detract for me um, one of the main draws to the Google Marketplace. And uh, I, I don't think there are any. Uh, except for so-called security or authorization, things like this with Mozilla. Uh, the first question I asked, uh, sorry, I'll, I'll make it very brief. Uh, the first question I asked was, uh, basically, does Google make it trivial for the average user to install it, despite the fact it's not in the market? The second thing it shows you is the same thing we learned from Amazon, when they deleted, what, 1984 from people's Kindles. Uh, the question is, do we want a centralized authority to tell us what to install? I mean, even Windows can be called so-called open, because you can install things you want on it, even malware if you, if you choose. Uh, and and they, they, they're going to change that pretty soon, I suppose, with uh, Windows 8. They want to like put a kind of DRM-enabled type shop for applications and basically centralize and say, well, Microsoft will be the adult supervising what you install in your system. And in this case, the fact that Google has this ability to centralize or to tell people this is where you want to buy your toys and your apps. I'm not sure if they can call it apps because Apple is to be the bully with trademarks. But uh, if this is where, if this is the main place where the average user is going to look for an application and assume this is what I can use and this is only the thing that's available to me, uh, then Google is in a position where it gives a lot of power for people to tell you what you can and cannot use, and maybe even remove things remotely, which it can do, by the way. So we know Android can remove your applications, which it hasn't done so much before. And no. I don't think, I think they're very careful with the switch. Yeah, I don't want the deletion of the cost controversy if they did. Uh, but they have well, the ability to even, I think, disable the phones completely remotely. So it's, uh, we, we saw a warning signal recently with a couple of malicious applications. Now, on that... Uh in that case, if uh, memory serves me correct, my, um, Google did actually exercise their uh, kill switch and did actually delete them off the phones of the users that had installed them, which I mentioned at the time in an article was a, a rather worrying trend. It's For me, you can't have one thing or the, or the other. If you're going to have an open marketplace and an, an open development environment, you can't start invoking a kill switch. Uh, yeah. I always said that the best way that Google could have got around the whole malware issue was to have a list of Google-approved apps and just let the marketplace be free. I think, uh, we have three issues here, three layers of issues, and uh, actually there are more, and I recently tried to outline them. So the first is uh, Google controls your operating system, or companies like Samsung will control your implementation of the operating system, and they do it using bootloaders and things which will basically refuse to work in the device unless it's the expected implementation. That's devisation, essentially. Uh, the second thing is they want to control which applications you can control and run on your uh, machine, and they will check that. Uh, the third is Google wants you to use so-called cloud computing, so they want your data as well. They want to own your data, and if you do something suspicious or you know, maybe you're supporting the, the so-called terrorists of, uh, you know, the high-tech terrorists of WikiLeaks or something, that's, that's the way to call it, they might want to do something to your documents, to your files. They might want to show them to the government and maybe delete them. So 
they want your data as well. So, so this is showing you how from a state way back in the days where you can control your code, uh, you could install anything you wanted and run anything you wanted on